sign up. Uh, be able to better prepare. And then starting in October, October the 1st, first Sunday, uh, October 1 is on a Sunday, we're going to start a series in the book of Acts. And so on the back table back there are these little reading schedules, and it's really easy because it's one chapter a day, and so if it's October the 7th, then you're in chapter 7, and so on and so forth. And so, but uh, everybody likes something to sort of um, uh, check off, and so there's your check off to do that. On the back, um, we're going to, for this series, do a little something a little different, have some discussion online, discussion and or just, hey, you, you know, you were reading and you thought this verse was neat or great or had a question about it. We're going to have a private uh, Facebook group discussion for it. So private meaning folks can't just find the group because we want folks who are in and around the series. So if you're in the room and or online and you would like to be a part of that, we'll need to send you an invite for it. So you won't be able to find it. If you're already a follower of or you have liked the page, our uh, Virginia Hills Woodstock Facebook page, then uh, I can send you an invite. If you haven't, uh, gone on and become a follower of and or have liked the page, let me encourage you to do that. When you do that, then I'll see it come through and then I'll send you uh, the invite. The way you can do that, one of the ways is you can either go online and just type in on, on Facebook and search for Virginia Hills Church. We have our public page there. Join it or follow it or whatever it asks you to do, and then we'll send you the invite from that. Or you can take your trusty uh, phone, point the camera at that QR code, and it'll take you to the page. Uh, if you have not yet been uh, signed up for our email, uh, and because we'll communicate uh, through that as well for the uh, series, same thing, point your uh, camera at that QR code, a little tab will come up, tap it, and it'll send you to, uh, to sign up for our email. One of the uh, neat little things we'll do for this coming series is uh, this is uh, the book of Acts, and so it's just the book of Acts, and it's a journaling Bible. So every other page is a blank page, and you'll all get one of these. We'll have them, have them here for next week, and then we'll hand them out also on October 1. If you're hearing me online and you would like one, um, comment or whatever, and we'll try to uh, get you one. We'll have to private message or something so you don't put your um, address uh, online. But we'll give these out. Uh, next week. And then, um, yeah, so you get the journal, you get a, a, a reading schedule, we'll have an online uh, discussion time for it, and we are praying that uh, the Lord blesses it well as we get in and around uh, His Word. That's that. Let me share this prayer with you this morning, or this afternoon, rather. Romans 8.26 says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought to. We don't always know what to pray for, for ourselves, right? And so the Spirit helps us in our weakness. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Spirit of God's praying for you praying for you. He is so engaged in your life. He is praying. Maybe you have prayed for somebody like that before. It's like it's overwhelming. You haven't been able to think of anything else. And sometimes you get to a place to where you don't even know what to say. The same thing. The Holy Spirit knows what to say, but Paul says it's so deep, it's hard to even talk about it. Paul says, I can't even come up with human words to, to, to like let you know what the Holy Spirit is praying for you. As I pray right now, would you pray this simple prayer? Dear Father, whatever the Holy Spirit is praying for me, I'm in agreement with it. And I ask you to answer what the Holy Spirit is praying for me. Would you pray that? Father in heaven, we can, I can, Lord, without any hesitation, say yes. 
yes to whatever the Spirit is praying on my behalf. He is interceding for me. I'm in agreement with it. Even though I do not know exactly what it is, I know it has to be for my good. And Lord, my good, I may not agree with that. But Lord, I trust you. I thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. I ask you, uh, Father in heaven, to answer his prayer for me. In Christ's name, amen. Stand with me if you would, and let's worship together. Sometimes you've got to dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you've got to stare down the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you've got to shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that he's going to get you there. Sometimes you've got to welcome the wonder, wait for the answer there. Worship with your hands in the air, I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Sometimes you gotta praise in the prison, cry out to heaven, shout till the doors swing wide. Sometimes you've gotta stand on your shackles, brave in the battles, worship with your hands held high. I'll praise you anywhere, praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy, yes, he is worthy of all the praise. Think about this. Faithful all my life, blessings day and night. Countless reasons why I'll praise you anywhere. Every promise kept, goodness every step, each and every breath. I'll praise you anywhere, faithful all. Amen. Blessings day and night, countless reasons why I'll praise you anywhere. Every promise kept, goodness every step. Each and every breath, I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy, yes, he is worthy of all the church he is worthy let's give him praise and he is our reason for singing let's sing about it here you brought me from darkness and clothed me in garments of praise Jesus forever my song will be you. I'm living in freedom. You've taken my burdens away. Jesus forever. My song will be you. Only for you. For the 
cross that you bore and the death that you paid for the victory you've won over death and the grave this is the reason i sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me this is the reason i sing silent I'll testify of your grace Jesus forever my song will be you only for you for the cross that you bore and the death that you paid for the victory you've won over death and the grave this is the and I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me this is the reason I sing so good so good so good it's so good to me So good, you're so good to me forever. I'll sing, you're so good to me. For the cross that you bore and the death that you paid, for the victory you've won over death and the grave. This is the reason I sing For the hope that you give And the joy that you bring For the promise that heaven is waiting for me This is the reason I sing For the cross that you bore And the death that you paid For the victory you've won over death and the grave This is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me come on sing this out this is the reason i say jesus the reason i say jesus the reason i sing amen he is our reason Oh 
church you guys sound great take this opportunity to turn it around and greet your neighbor Next Sunday, we'll have a visiting preacher with us, um, he and his wife. Uh, hopefully, she can be with him. She's actually the better half of the two. And so, uh, Pastor Phil from Crossroads, I was actually preached for him this morning. They have a 1030 service, and I've been over there a few times, actually, and uh, I'm able to do that because we have a two o'clock service here. But uh, he has just been one of the pastors that uh, he and I and uh, Pastor Brian get together on most Wednesdays and pray uh, for our churches, pray for our area, pray for our county. And he is going to, I'm going to be here myself, but uh, he's just going to uh, uh, 
uh, preach before we start this series coming up in October. All of that to say, um, if you find yourself on Saturday night saying, should I go to church or should I not go to church? The best thing you can do for your pastor is to show up when they have a visiting pastor. And so let me encourage you uh, next Sunday to be here if you can, if you're in the area. We would certainly appreciate that. And then we'll kick off our series starting in October 1st. Uh, We are in a intermittent series, meaning that we're just coming and going, uh, sort of in between series. But this Red Skies series, uh, you're going to see this more throughout this uh, the rest of this year and probably first part of the uh, next next uh, next year, uh, Lord willing, uh, and it's and it's a uh, a message or a series about uh, the last days. And so last week we started this introduction, discerning the signs of the times. And I said, uh, you know, uh, somebody says, "Are we in the last days?" Yes, we've been in the last days, according to Peter, who stood up on the day of Pentecost and said. Uh, this is this, talking about the day of Pentecost, he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And so Peter even recognized this is that last days doesn't mean few days. Last days just simply means there's nothing that has to take place prophetically before the Lord's return or before the rapture. And so we are in the last days. However, uh, as Matthew 24 says, you should be able to discern a fruit tree just before it begins to give fruit. You can watch it. You can say, hey, there are the blooms. And if it's blooming, then probably fruit is soon to follow. Or he says you should be able to discern uh, an expectant mother who is beginning to feel birth pains. And so we're not trying to predict a day or an hour because the Bible says no man knows the day or hour. However, When it speaks of a thief in the night, the Lord comes like a thief in the night, we use that as if the Lord's going to slip in on everybody. That very passage says, but he shouldn't catch us like that. And so we should be able to see the signs of the times, even though it's all last days, and be able to say that, well, you'll see what the reference says when it talks about more and more. And so what I want to do over the next little bit, interspersed in between other series, is just talk to you like one sign after another. So red sky sign number one. That is, to me, it's the, what I see like a, uh, what you would say a, uh, an exponential, uh, exponentially you see this. Though, there, though the deception is as old as mankind itself, but it's the exponential growth, the prevalence, depth, and collaboration of deception. So one of the things that I think in trying for, as as a pastor, trying to prepare and instruct uh, the people that God has allowed me to, uh, to be an influence with is to be able to say to us with no prediction of the Lord's return on any given day, Whatever I'm going to suggest to us won't hurt us, even if the Lord doesn't come back. It's all good for us. But one of the things that causes me to believe that these that we should be able, as as uh, um, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you see a red sky at night, and you know how to interpret that. You see a red sky in the morning, and you know how to interpret that. And yet he says that. Uh, that you can't understand the time in which you're living right now. And that's where the red sky came from. And so we should be able to see the signs of the time and make some kind of like, okay, we should be, we should be paying attention to this. I don't know like exactly how close, but like this is, uh, this, this gets your attention because it is more and more. Let me read the scripture for you. Uh, Paul says this to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, Verses 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, stressful, or your translation may say perilous. It's actually the word translated best for stressful. Um, (laughs) Do these feel like stressful times? Now, these aren't the only times it's ever felt stressful. I get that. I understand that. I've got a book in my library. And the book is this preacher preaching about the, uh, about the young generation these days and how they need, you know, how uh, 
uh, like they hang out on the street corners, and he was just giving the, t- the, the young people like down the road, they hang out on the street corner, they're up to no good, and da 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 The book was written in the 1600s. So like, Everything is relative to its time, right? And so everybody believes like, oh, these are the worst days. I get that. But when there is something collectively where almost you could survey 10 people almost anywhere around the globe and say, do you feel like these times are a little more stressful than others? What, eight out of 10 are going to say, yeah, I kind of feel that. That's what you're looking for. Uh, And so he says, Know this, that in the last days, stressful times will come. Last days, stressful times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Verse 3, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, like walk up behind the old lady on the street and punch her brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness. Now, this is an interesting verse because chances are, as I was reading that list, you were thinking of non-Christians, That's not what Paul was telling Timothy to beware of. He's talking about this within and around the church, like capital C church. He said they'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny its power. Paul tells Timothy that in these last days, you get in and around, let's just say, church folk, and they'll have, the, they'll have a familiar language that we're all sort of familiar with, like we all talk it, but we are in denial of its power or we are in denial of the true source. The Laodicean church that, that John uh, speaks to in the book of Revelation says, you say you have need of nothing, that you're rich and wealthy and have need of nothing. What was that church doing? They were denying the true source. They didn't need the Lord because they were affluent. They had everything they needed, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. Later on in that letter, verses 12 and 13, it says this, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We don't want it. (laughs) We won't sign up for it. If I could avoid it, I would. But in these days, it should not shock and or surprise you that Christians seemingly are one of the few groups that can be targeted and nobody really steps, steps up, speaks up, takes up for them. Those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But but evil men and seducers will grow. uh, Also, that word could be imitators. There'll be people to come along pretending to be one thing when they're actually another. They come along saying one thing, but actually have a different intent or a motive for what they're saying. But evil men and seducers will grow. Now, notice this phrase, worse and worse. And then here's the sign, deceiving and also being deceived. There are some people who know what they're doing and they're deceiving. They're being deceitful on purpose, like that's evil. There are also people who you might, who who believes maybe that they're doing the right thing, but they're actually being deceived. They're doing the wrong thing, but they've been influenced by the deceivers, and so they join like the they they join to oppose God, but not like they don't know what they're doing. 
They're just being deceived. So you've got this, in the last days, evil men will grow worse and worse and deceiving and being deceived. And so this is like one of the signs for God's people then. It's like, I, 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 I do not myself want to grow um, jaded or uh, skeptical or cynical, but you do want to be wise if there's ever a day where we ought to be praying for God's wisdom, it's today. Uh, because we want to be what the Lord would have us to be. And at the same time, we don't want to be deceived. Because there is, a, there's a, there is the potential of being influenced by and deceived by folks who will, who will have a form of godliness. It's like, man, it almost sounds right but they deny the power from which that, from which that comes. In other words, when, and when they deny the power that's outside of them, meaning the power of the Holy Spirit, that means the answers are within. Beware of the crowd who tells you that you're enough. Well, you're not. I'm not. I'm not enough. In Christ, I'm more than enough. But without him, I can do nothing. So you want to be careful about the crowd who wants you to look to yourself for all the answers. All the answers are within you. That is humanistic. That is that you're looking to your flesh. And on the surface, when you hear that, it's like, yeah, I am enough. Well, no. No, you're not. If you were, Jesus did not have to come. He died for you because you couldn't die for yourself. You couldn't take, you couldn't take the, you couldn't pay the price needed to be paid. You're not enough. But with Christ, you are more than enough. And so all of our source, all of, our, all of my standing comes because of who Jesus is in me and through me and not anything in and of me by myself. But in the last days, you'll hear people, folks, podcaster, influencer, preacher, teacher, they'll have, what they say, I mean, like almost... The, the initial thought is, yeah, I like that. Well, you have to be careful because what you might like about it is appealing to your flesh. And man, you got to be careful with that. Before you know it, it's like you fed yourself a whole lot of self and you walk out of the room or you leave the vehicle or you go on and, 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 and you got more confidence in you. Dear friend, that's not us. That's not God's people. We are desperate we are a desperate people. We are a broken people. We are a people that recognizes our brokenness and our weakness and our need for Jesus. But in the last days, that dece deceitful word, in other words, <laughs> there'll be a lot of things that you're going to know right off the, you know, like, oh, that's evil, that's wicked, you know, and you don't even have to think about it. But in the last days, what's going to grow worse and worse is the messaging. The messaging is going to sound close. And on the surface, initially, it sounds like, oh, that, that might even come from the Bible. And then you take it, you read it, you listen to it, you're influenced by it, and before you know it, you are more self-absorbed, narcissistic, just thinking of you. We got to be careful. Last days, there'll be those who are deceiving and being deceived. Here's the thing that we have to sort of remind ourselves of 98% of what you believe that's going on in the world, you do not know that personally. You got that from a screen somewhere, right? There's a television screen, a phone, a tablet, a laptop. What you believe going on, in, and I'm not saying what you believe is going on in the world. I don't, I'm not saying that it's not going on. I'm just saying you don't have firsthand knowledge of it. What you believe is going on in the world, you have heard from somebody else, and that somebody else, chances are, comes from a screen, not personally. I believe they are fighting in the Ukraine. I don't know that personally. I think they are. I see people on television tell me they are. I've seen videotape that it is. 
I don't know it personally, and I haven't had somebody over there coming back and say, oh, yeah, look here, I got shot. So I don't know it personally. Most of everything that I believe about the world, like out there, I'm hearing it from a screen. Good and bad. That's a good and bad thing. It's good in the fact that we can be informed. I like that. I want to be informed. I don't want to live with my head in, the, in, in, a, in a hole. The thing I have to be careful with is when you get, when most all of your information is not firsthand information, or it's somebody that you trust, in a, in a, when I mean by you trust, somebody that you know, we're all getting our information, so maybe from different sources, different news channels or different podcasters or different, you know, influencers. It might be different people, but nonetheless, it's all like out there. It's all coming from a screen. And there's never been a day, one thing that truly is like somewhat different than days gone past is the ability to deceive through that screen. The era or the, 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 uh, the term or the word deep fake is a thing now, right? This picture here, this guy is pretending to be Tom Cruise. And you've probably seen this. You thought, well, there, Tom Cruise is saying some of the strangest things. No, Tom Cruise didn't say it. The guy to the left there said it. But he was able through imaging and through, through video editing or whatever, he was able to take on Tom Cruise's features and with Tom Cruise's voice. And so you watch and you say, did you see that video from Tom Cruise? It wasn't Tom Cruise at all. It was some other person. But the ability to deceive is, and I'm not saying that what he said, I don't even know what he said. I just remember the whole thing went around the internet, said the deep fake of Tom Cruise, and everybody thought it was Tom Cruise, and it wasn't Tom Cruise, and it may have just been for a joke. It, 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 the content or, or what he said is not the point. The point is the ability to be able to use the technology, and before you know it, you think somebody said something, and they had no idea that was, thing was even being said. You've probably seen this uh, recently in the news, uh, the, where they can scam you on your phone. Because of artificial intelligence, and especially if they can, like somebody like myself who is, you know, I'm online, and so they've got, they've got, they've got my voice, they've got hours and hours of my voice recording, they can take that recording, they can then make me say anything. And they don't even have to get the, they don't even have to catch like the word. Once they get my voice, then the, I can, they can cause me to use words that I don't even know. And you would think it's me. And so now the thing is, and they can hack into your phone. And so literally I see that on my phone, oh, my daughter called and it says Rachel and, and there's, there's, it says her name. Because they've gotten, they've hacked into her phone. So I see her name come up. I say, hello, and it's Rachel. It sounds like Rachel, but it's not Rachel. And before you know it, she's telling me she's in trouble and she needs X amount of money. And I'm giving, them, I'm giving who I think is Rachel a credit card number. You just have to slow down long enough. And they say you can still sort of detect it if you can slow the process down long enough to realize, like, I don't think she would say that, but... They've captured her voice. They make it say whatever they want to say. They hacked into her phone. They've got her number. It's what her number is what comes up. You hear her voice. It's just not her. So this is the latest. Is the, now, so the ability to deceive, you probably saw this go around the uh, internet for a little while. This is a picture of Hobby Lobby. And they said, look what Hobby Lobby, that's like a Christian group, or look what they're selling now, all of these images, uh, the, these demonic images from Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby took a financial punch for two or three days before Hobby Lobby could get the word out that that's not us. Somebody photoshopped those images and said it was Hobby Lobby, and Hobby Lobby took a financial punch until they could catch back up to the, like, no, no you, that's, we don't have that hanging on our walls inside of Hobby Lobby. The ability, the ability to whip up a mob 
is going to be easier and easier and easier. So like before you even know what has happened and before you realize that Hobby Lobby got punked or scammed or whatever you want to call it, before you realize that, you done whipped up a mob to almost do anything. And here's the thing, the, the technology for that is going to be stronger and stronger and stronger. It's going to be hard to discern when the majority of the information we receive is through a screen or th through, some, through anything that's not like, I, I, I was there, I'm an eyewitness to it. Or I have a friend or a buddy who was there, they're eyewitnesses to it. We can speak to this. Everything else, we just got to be more and more careful. The ability to deceive, to me, is like, I don't, these signs really aren't like in any certain priority. Um, to me, this, the, this the, the ability to deceive almost, to me, is just like the obvious one, one of the obvious ones. And we'll talk about like other signs of uh, later on, but this is one that I, that I watch and it's like, good night, man. You know, the, the ability to, the, the ability to create a narrative and to be able to get information out to a mass of people and deceive them and have damage done before the mass even realizes that we've all got deceived that ability is greater and greater and greater. Here's the problem with prolonged deception. Prolonged deception has a double-edged sword to it. In other words, when you have authorities or people in power or control or just people who have influence, and they begin to use these tools of deception over and over and over again, what you have to be careful with is it has this double-edged sword. The obvious, the obvious uh, uh, edge is that they can trick you into accepting a lie. Just we say it long enough, loud enough, and have enough folks behind us, and you say, well, the, yeah, the, you know, the consensus is. You don't know if there's a consensus to it or not. You just, you're just taking the word that most people believe this. Why don't you believe this? And you say, well, most, most people? Okay, well, maybe I need to relook at this. No, it's not most people. You were taking their word for it. You didn't go out and do a survey. So they're able to trick you into accepting a non-truth. Or the subtle edge that's equally as sharp as this, it manipulates you into second-guessing the truth when you do hear the truth. This is the challenge in relationships when you live with people who are prone to lie. You get real good at sort of picking up on the lie. The double-edged sword to that is, even when they tell you the truth, you're not really for sure. So it's hard to trust them. So it creates this, this angst with sort of everybody involved. It's like, I don't know if you're true or not true or how is this going? In my opinion, and this is just my opinion, so I call it my op-ed, take it for what it's worth, and I, and I wrote down my opinion so, I, so I'd make sure I said what I wanted to say and not get off on a tangent. The most harmful deception that I see today is from some politicians, clinicians, educators, and administrators seducing young, impressionable, and troubled children into believing they were born wrong, manipulating them into believing that their identity confusion can be remedied by life-altering surgery and lifelong medication. That, to me, my opinion, is the greatest deception that I see today. I don't have any malice angst or anything toward the young people, toward that youngster. None at all. I'm upset with those who are supposed to know better, 
those who have learned, they're either deceiving or they're being deceived themselves. They're hearing it from somebody else and they go along with it for a myriad of reasons. Some is to stay in good standing with whoever they're wanting to impress. Others is just for straight up for the love of money. But to me, that's the greatest deception. Here is my prophecy, and I don't claim to be a prophet. So if you're not, if you're not comfortable with somebody claiming a prophecy, then at least just my prediction. In two to five years, there'll be a tsunami of despair overwhelming our young people. A tsunami of despair coming. For a lot of these young people, I mean young people, adults, hey, I'm a libertarian. You can do what you want. But these children, they should be left alone. I predict, because you're already seeing it, and we hear it in the ministry, but I predict that there will be an overwhelming tsunami of despair coming from this younger generation when the actions that they have taken and that they were manipulated to take now cause them to believe they're trapped. So here's the question, or here's the warning now to the church, to us, and to anybody who wants to hear me online. If our response to their despair is a judgmental, we told you so, then we forfeit our standing to speak at all to this generation. We cannot as a church, we cannot as a church, have a response to a hurting, hurting world. Our response can't be, well, we told you so, or you should have listened to us. No, no. Dear friend, if that's our response, then... then we take the mic away from you. You, got, you, you're not, you shouldn't be speaking for the Lord because that can't be. We're a church. We're a church. We represent the Lord Jesus. And that's not, the, that's not what you see him communicating when he was here. He walked into the, he walked straight head into the despair of a hurting people. And he did not pass judgment upon them. So we must, as a church, and this is my prayer, as a church, we must communicate from a posture of humility. Humility, friend. Humility like I'm a sinner too, humility. Humility like I got stuff too, humility. Humility like I've got baggage too. Humility like I've got broken pieces too. Humility. Humility like I need help too. Humility. Humility like I've got weaknesses too. Humility. Humility like I've made mistakes too. I've done wrong too. I've got my own sin too. Humility like I'm, I'm, the, I'm not any different, any better, any more sinless than anybody else. Humility. We must communicate a posture of humility with a message of hope. That's what this younger generation is going to need, a message coming from a, an individual with some humility, coming from a group of people that's got like a posture of humility. But we've got to have, we've got to share some hope and let this younger crowd, this younger generation understand that the greatest identity you'll ever discover I want you to be on a discovery of your identity. I think that's a beautiful thing. And I pray and hope that you discover that who you are in Christ is going to be your greatest discovery of your life. Because in and of yourself, if you are feeling inadequate, if you're not feeling enough, I want you to know the answer is not more of you. The answer is Jesus. And bringing Jesus into your life and letting him be all that he needs and wants to be for you and to you. And in the pursuit of Jesus, dear friend, you will discover your greatest identity. Paul mentions this little phrase over and over and over in his writings. It was two words, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Who you are in Christ. 
makes all the difference. Who you are outside of Christ or who you are without Christ, I'm telling you, it sort of doesn't really matter what road you go down because they're all twisted and broken. But discover who you are in Christ. And as a church, this is the message that we have to bring, especially to a young generation who in just a few short years is going to be overwhelmed with despair. And I pray, my prayer is, as they hear a message of hope from a people who are humble. And that message meaning or saying that it's in Jesus that you will find what you are looking for, the longing you have in your soul, the longing you have in your soul for purpose. You know that you're here for something more. You know that there's more to life than just up and down in school and, and, and the next little thing or the next weekend or the next party. You know there's something more, and there is. Christ made you for something more. You have a high and holy and sacred purpose. You may not be driving a Lamborghini and living the life of a, of a rock star, but your purpose for your life was engineered by God himself before you ever were formed in your mother's womb. Discover it, learn it, find it. That's where you'll find true life and true happiness and true meaning. To us, who like is on the same page with this, uh, the, the deception that we see, I'll just give you two points and I'm, I'm done for trying to become a little more deception-proof. Number one, I would just simply say to you, choose your influencers wisely. Choose your influencers wisely. I would encourage you, those who have the greatest influence in your life should be real people in your real life. Because anybody you're watching on a screen, you're only seeing their highlights. And we're fashioning our life after people that we don't know after they turn off the recording. They're fussing and they're fighting with their wife or their spouse. Their life is in shambles. But I saw 90 seconds of it and it seemed great to me and I would really like to live their life. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't trade with them if you found out what their life really was. And yet we have let influencers influence us for a life that they get to curate only to show you what they want to show you. So choose your influencers wisely. Let the heroes be. People that you know in your life, even with their flaws and their weaknesses, that you would still give them a passing grade. And you would say, yeah, they're not perfect. But man, they seem to be happy. They seem to have some joy. They seem to be doing okay. They seem to be all right. They seem to be well. I want to get in and around that person. I want to sort of follow the steps of that person. It's probably people in and around your life that love you. And that if uh, you would give them a little extra attention or a nod every once in a while you'd be amazed about how they could be a great example. Real people in real life. Choose your influencers wisely. Second Timothy, Paul says this to Timothy as he's writing. In verse 10, it says this, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct. No, no, look what Paul says. My conduct, my aim, my life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and sufferings. That's key. You're following somebody who has suffered I'm very careful about being influenced by, there are young, there are young pastors that, I've, that I like read after and follow, but, if, but the ones that I've chosen to follow are ones who have suffered. There's a young man that I follow, he's, a, he's 20 years younger than I, but he's buried a child. I think you got something to say, and I'm interested in hearing what you got to say. Not because of the great church that you're building, but because of the suffering that you've had in life. And so it's the suffering that draws me to, like, I'm interested in what this fella has to say. People who haven't suffered, and they just sort of like, you know, lucked up, so to speak, great for you. It's just not going to have much influence with me. I want to know that you've been through some stuff and that you've, that you've, been, that you've been punched in the gut 
and that you're still standing and you're still making it. And you do have a little question from time to time about what the Lord is doing. At least that's sincere and honest, right? He said, Paul says this, you've known all that, my persecutions, my suffering. You've known what has happened to me. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and, ha and, and have firmly believed, knowing whom you've learned it from. Choose your influencers wisely. Know enough about them to know they've been through some stuff. They've got some, they've, they've had some pain. They've managed, uh, they've been hurt, they've been knocked down, they've, you know, they've been through the ringer and they're still standing. They still have faith, they still have joy, they still have a smile on their face. They can still come to a church service and lift their hands and worship the Lord. And I know that and I see that in their life. Dear friend, I'm all ears. And, and people online or folks that you know, they may have that too. I just don't know that. And so uh, I may follow you uh, online, but I'm going to be very careful about how much influence I really allow you to sort of have in my life when I don't know your life well enough. Number two, uh, number, yeah, number two, teach your children the scriptures. Moms, dads, memory verses, Write them down on the wall, stick them on the fridge, write them on the little sticky tab, up on the mirror. Teach our children the, our ver the, the, the scripture. Uh, every like week or month or whatever, like have a family scripture that you're learning together. Something, fit it for your life, but, but, but increase the... the the value to your children, the value of learning the scripture. Because they're going to grow up and they're going to listen to some professor who's lost his faith or, or who's not had any faith at all, and he's going to demote it, denounce it, and speak disparagingly of it. And you want, to, you want that, the scripture can't return void. Get it in them. They may walk away from it for a little while, but they won't walk away from it forever. Get that scripture in them and start early. Have verses like, hey, let's, let's go over this verse. Prioritize, and this may give me, don't write me off immediately, but prioritize wisdom over knowledge. I didn't say ignore knowledge. Knowledge is important. Get, get knowledge. Yeah, read. You know, all the reading, writing, arithmetic, all of it. Get it all. But prioritize wisdom. Lift wisdom up. And wisdom, godly wisdom, comes from the Scripture. And so, yes, let's applaud our children when they bring home the math that says A+. Plus. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. I want you to do great. Applaud them when they come home with the, you know, they got the essay from English and they're doing well. Yes, I want you to do great. I don't want you messing around. I don't want to discount that. But, man, we're going to throw a party when you learn Scripture. I want you learning scripture because it's scripture that's going to give you the wisdom. You say, how is that? How does that make sense? Jesus chose the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise of this world. And so you just, just prioritize, get that wisdom. Paul says this to Timothy in verse 15. And from, a, and from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. When did you get a hold of it, Timothy? When you was a kid. Paul says, I know this is in you. You got it as a kid. You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make one, what? Wise for salvation. And that's not just salvation of the soul. That means like that's, that's redeeming your life, remodeling, uh, redoing your life. Uh, make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Because, here's the thing you got to understand, your AI, artificially intelligent infused enemy, he will have more worldly knowledge than you. You can't compete. This is why those who are like in the know in technology, like they're somewhat fearful of AI because they know AI now already can create a narrative that's hard for you to argue with. Artificial intelligence could come up with a case against me that would be really hard for you to argue with. 
And so AI, AI infused, uh, they're going to have more worldly knowledge. And I don't mean worldly knowledge like in bad knowledge. I'm just talking about just like knowledge of the world around you. And so because of that, they'll be able to create a narrative that you're, that's going to be hard for you to argue with. And so whatever it is that they're trying to get us to believe, they're going to make a really good argument from it from a worldly, and again, not like bad way, but like, from a, like, like a way that that makes sense. They'll be able to do that. Because they, will ha because they have the technology now at hand to do it. So they'll have more knowledge than you, but not more godly wisdom. They won't have wisdom. Wisdom comes from the Lord. And so, yes, get, get your knowledge. Go after knowledge. Understand knowledge. Uh, granted, I want to learn. I want to grow. Nothing, nothing wrong with it, but don't. Short change, uh, wisdom. You get wisdom. Psalm 119, 98 uh, says this, last verse. Your commandments, the psalmist said, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are always with me. And we're coming into a day where we need to be wiser than our enemies. How can we be wiser than our enemies? You're not going to be smarter than them because they'll be able to access through technology every piece of information almost ever been known to man. So they're going to be able to come up with a, quite a convincing narrative about whatever they want to sell you on. But, but your word, the psalmist said, makes me wiser. I'm not fearful of them. The reason I'm not fearful of them is I'm not, I, don't, I don't know it all, <laughs> but I know enough. I know enough to know where my source is. I know enough to know what I'm, going to, what, what, what I'm going to stand on. And so when the questions come like, hey, how do we believe in this? Or how, where do we stand there? I, I know where I'm going to go to. I'm going to have the scripture to, to give me my footing to know where I stand. And if it goes against the common knowledge of the world, so be it. I know where I'm going to stand because I know I have the scripture on my side. And where I have the scripture on my side, I'll have God's wisdom to help. And then we leave the results in the hands of the Lord. Uh, we live in a day where, uh, where uh, there will be evil men. They'll be deceived, and they themselves will be deceived. But we don't have to be. We don't have to be. Get to the Word. Let me encourage you to have a revival in your home, especially with our kids. The importance of the Word of God a verse here, a verse there, a passage. Get it in their system. Get it in their system. Get it in their heart. Get it in their minds. That's going to be the greatest, uh, what shall we say, uh, the greatest inoculation, right, to whatever the world's going to throw at us. Um, get the Word of God. Stand with me if you would. Let me pray for us. Uh, remember, please, the, uh, we'll start the uh, book of Acts in two weeks. There's reading there. There's a way to, if you want to join in on the Facebook page, uh, there we'll have these booklets for you starting next week. Sign up, ladies, for the uh, brunch if you'd like to come. There'll be a breakfast. You can bring a dish if you'd like. Um, and then there'll always be a craft because my wife's involved and wherever she's involved, there's a craft. That's just the way it goes. But I appreciate you being here uh, this afternoon. Father, I pray you'd help us. Help us to be um, wise. Help us, Lord, to be humble. Help us, Father, to have hope on the tip of our tongue as we speak to the world around us. Help us. You said, Lord, that you will give wisdom. You'll give it to those who ask. The mere fact that we're asking, Lord, is a, is a humbling thing because it means we don't have it. We don't have enough. And so we come to you humbly asking for wisdom about how to navigate these days when deception is going to be easier and easier for people 
who want to engage it and use it. And it's going to be harder and harder for those of us who consider ourselves just to be in the crowd, just to be in the number. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to dim the lights of the screens of this world. And, Lord, turn a light onto your word more and more. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you, dear folks.